Ahoy, my friends. You've just tuned into Anthology of Heroes, the podcast sharing tales of heroes from across the ages. And this is part two, the final part, of the story of Fletcher Christian and his mutiny that led to the founding of a new nation on a tiny rock in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. In part one, I covered the events leading to the mutiny itself. We explained the mission of the HMS Bounty to collect fruit trees from Tahiti to replant in the West Indies as a source of cheap food. We talked about the early life of the two main characters, Captain William Bly and his close friend and mentee, Fletcher Christian. We walked through the conditions aboard the cramped ship and the contrasting, hedonistic, relaxed living the sailors got used to once they arrived in Tahiti. But most importantly, we spoke about the souring temperament of the HMS Bounty's crew towards Captain Bly, who were all well and truly sick of his tongue lashings, paranoid rants and threats. We left the episode with a chaotic but ultimately successful mutiny led by Fletcher Christian. Captain Bly and the majority of his loyalists have been lowered into a small lifeboat and cut adrift, with the ever-vengeful captain swearing justice if he ever reached the shores of England. You know the deal now, I'd recommend listening to part one for context first, but anyway, let's get into it. Here we go for part two of the story of Fletcher Christian and the mutiny that created a nation. As Christian walked the deck of the ship he now captained, he was aware of just how precarious his position was. Military order had been dashed to the wind. The crew had been taught by him that if they were unhappy with the rules, just break them. He cleverly called for a vote. All crew could nominate whoever they wished to be captain of the vessel. Christian, of course, won the vote, but the empty gesture served to wash away any doubts from all the men about his worthiness to lead. Even so, Christian never felt at ease. He carried a loaded pistol with him at all times that was visible on his person. Next up, the cursed breadfruit. The items of contention that had pushed Bly into their personal space were dumped overboard. The men now had more than enough space to sleep, but there wasn't too much time for that. With a reduced crew, every man worked hard out of sheer necessity. Christian took on the duties of captain, navigator, and a few others. He didn't really have a choice. Almost half his crew were deckhands, with the majority of the officer class leaving with Bly. Knowing that the heavy workload would sour the crew's mood quickly, Christian decided that the mutineers would settle on the island of Tubui, one of the islands that make up modern French Polynesia. They landed to a frosty reception with the natives. As mentioned in part one, Tahiti was a bit of an oddity in being so open to Westerners. Many of these islands were downright hostile to outsiders. A skirmish broke out when the natives turned on the sailors, trying to fleece them of all their valuables, including the ship itself. Eleven native men and a woman were killed in the fighting. Christian's men held strong with their far superior technology. Despite this, Christian was determined to make the location work. He figured that eventually the locals would be cowed into acceptance of their new neighbours. But what kind of life would this be? Twenty men who tolerated each other but not much more, living in constant fear of a much larger native population. This wouldn't do at all. An expedition was launched to return to Tahiti, which sat due north of their current position. The Tahitians were surprised to see the bounty returning, just a couple of months after it had left. They were probably not expecting another visitor for around five years or so. Christian concocted a story to fool his generous hosts about how he had transported the breadfruit to Captain Cook, who was very grateful to them. Remember, Captain Cook was long dead at this point, And that they had been sent back to return by the revered captain who now required much more food and supplies. The generous Tahitians held Cook's memory in great honour and they dug deep to help him out. By the time the crew departed, the bounty was full to the brim. 460 pigs, 50 goats and a bunch of chickens, dogs and cats. But the deceitful crew went a step further. Knowing full well they would struggle to convince the Tahitians to leave their earthly paradise, they invited them on board for a party, a goodbye celebration, and then just left. Once the kidnapped men and women figured out they were being abducted, they begged to return home, but it was to no avail. Once they arrived back on Tabui, Christian found out that he didn't quite possess Bly's skills in diplomacy. He eventually came to an agreement with a local chieftain to let his band settle on a piece of land, but soon decided the land was no good and moved on to more fertile fields that belonged to another chief. The new chief wasn't as receptive, especially when Christian let their pigs loose, destroying the settlement's crops. 
Christian had upset not just the natural ecosystem of the small island, but also the political one, as both chiefs began to argue, blaming each other for the problems these white visitors had brought. The settlers themselves were not even unified as a group. It was like Lord of the Flies, but instead of food, it was sex. Resentment simmered as one man watched another man laugh and chat with his new wife. There simply weren't enough women for everyone to couple up. For the Tahitian men, they were okay with sharing their partner. This arrangement was normal in their society. But the Europeans still found this unacceptable. They all wanted their own monogamous partner, regardless of whose wife that woman may have been originally. In addition to this friction, scouting parties were ambushed by the island's native inhabitants. The men came stumbling back into camp, bruised, battered and robbed of all their valuables, especially things made out of iron. Christian also began to find his authority tested more and more, and after an order of his was disobeyed, he grabbed one of the sailors by the scruff of his collar, pushed a cocked pistol against his temple, and spat at him that if he ever disobeyed him again, he'd blow his brains out. Things were unravelling fast. The native Tahitian men, whose language was similar enough, plotted with the new Tabuans to kill all the Europeans, rightfully a little pissed off that they'd been forcibly abducted and then had their wives stolen by them. This led to another battle between the Europeans and the locals. It was a victory for the Europeans, but a costly one. One sailor died, and their musket powder was starting to run low. Once it was out, the natives held the advantage with their numbers. But still, Christian stuck to his guns, insisting they make the new colony work. But when he suggested dismantling the ship, the bounty, to construct a fortification, uh, that was when he overstepped his authority. Faced with the very real possibility of being forced to spend the rest of their life on an island full of women and men who wanted them dead, the crew confronted Christian that this was not happening. This settlement was no good and it was time to face the facts. It was decided that they would return to Tahiti. Originally, most of the crew were set on remaining there, but Christian, with his natural gift in theatrics, got in a soapbox and wistfully waxed lyrical about his dreams of sailing off into the sunset and accepting whatever destiny the universe had for him. His romantic speech won a good deal of support back to him, and four days later, once the ship had again returned to Tahiti, a good majority of the crew pledged their allegiance to Christian, come whatever may. After unceremoniously dumping those who wished to return to Tahiti on the beaches, the HMS Bounty, with a skeleton crew of Tabuans, Tahitians and Europeans, sailed forth into the great unknown. But first, a quick message from one of our friends of the show. Hello everyone, my name is Nick Mashinsky, host of A History of the Inca podcast. Join me as we learn how the Inca rose from just a small group out of hundreds to an empire that stretched from southern Colombia to central Chile, with some of the most extreme climates and terrains in the world. Along the way, we'll talk about the Inca culture, religion, architectural feats, and military conquests. You can find the show on all major podcasting platforms and at our website, ahistoryoftheinca.wordpress.com. And thank you for listening. From the original crew of 40 men, nine now remained. Supplementing this meager number were six Polynesians, 12 women and one baby. Making matters worse were the seasonal winds. The seas were rough and many of the crew had almost no sailing experience whatsoever. For the next few weeks, they sporadically hopped from island to island looking for something suitable. This portion of the journey has been painstakingly put together from diary fragments and brought alive by Google Earth from a man named Donald Albert. I've put the link to his fascinating interactive session on our website. It's well worth a look. While the crew gathered fresh water in Fiji, Christian busied himself in Bly's journals and maps. Bly had specifically requested that these were given to him when they jettisoned him on the lifeboat, so perhaps there was something in them that could help them. Christian came across a small footnote that mentioned an uncharted island that had been sighted some 100 years ago by a 15-year-old midshipman named Robert Pitcairn. Though other captains had confirmed the rough location of the island when passing through the area, none had charted or explored it. The only murky details of the island mentioned that it was rocky, with a shallow reef, tough swell, and seemingly no safe place to drop anchor. Any of these, Christian knew, was a big red flag to any potential Royal Navy captain. Who would put his ship at risk for the sake of a tiny island? There was not a single island in the Pacific Ocean that the British Crown would want to visit less than this one. It was perfect 
but now they had to find it. Navigational technology had jumped ahead significantly in the last 100 years. Naval ships in the 18th century relied on what's called a chronometer, a kind of timekeeping device that determined the position by comparing the time zone where the ship was currently in against the time zone in Greenwich, London. This time zone today is referred to as GMT-00, or Greenwich Mean Time. But when the island was sighted by young Robert Pitcairn, the main device used for navigating was the sextant, which gave an accurate longitude based on the sun and the horizon. But the device on board for determining latitude, the chronometer, hadn't been invented back then. So Pitcairn's notes on latitude could have just been a best guess. Well, it took them two miserable and bitterly cold months, tracking back and forth, but finally the distinctive shaped island came into view. For the Polynesians, the coldness and the monotony of ship life would have been something they'd never experienced, and you can bet they had no objection as to dropping anchor. After locating the single suitable bay for disembarking, the ragtag crew unloaded and began to explore their new home. Though the decision to find the island had been a shot in the dark, the crew could not have picked a better place to call home. The island was far away from others in the Pacific Ocean. In fact, it sat so far west that its closest neighbour was Easter Island off the coast of Chile. Not only that, but the island was a virtual fortress, shielded from the outside wall by rocky coastline and unpredictable swell. On shore, things were equally rugged. While the island flattened out further inland, on the outer perimeter were high cliffs pockmarked with a heap of caves that could be used to take shelter if anyone came looking. But most promising of all, though it showed signs of habitation in the past, it was now deserted. It seemed that finally, their long search was complete. They had found their home, warm, fertile and safe, their very own Garden of Eden. As the crew disembarked the HMS Bounty for the last time, they were sure the hard times were finally behind them. They could not have been more wrong. Every man had an axe to grind with another. Tension simmered below the surface, and the worst was yet to come. While his old crew had found refuge, thousands of kilometres away, a scruffy, thin and dark Captain Bly stumbled onto the docks of Kupang, an Indonesian colony ran by the Dutch. Against all odds, he had guided his overcrowded rowboat through the perilous Endeavour Straits between northern Australia and Indonesia. Navigating from memory and skill alone, Bly had reached civilization. Uniforms torn and ragged, he and his sailors looked more like out-of-work pirates than sailors of the Royal British Navy. Whatever you may think of the captain's conduct, the 47-day, 6,701 kilometres or 4,164 mile journey in an open top boat is nothing short of stunning and speaks wonders about his ability not just as a navigator but as a leader. The first of the outside world to learn about the events that took place was Bly's wife in a letter written to her, quote, Know then, my own dear Betsy, that I have lost the bounty. On the 28th of April at daylight, in the morning, Christian having the morning watch, he and several others came into my cabin while I was asleep and seized me. Holding naked bayonets at my breast, tied my hands behind my back and threatened instant destruction if I uttered a word. I, however, called loudly for assistance, but the conspiracy was so well laid that the officers' cabin doors were guarded by sentinels, so Nelson, Peckover, Samuels or the master could not come to me. I was now dragged on deck in my shirt and closely guarded. I demanded of Christian the case of such a violent act and severely degraded him for his villainy, but he could only answer, not a word, sir, or you are dead. I dared him to the act and endeavoured to rally someone to a sense of their duty but to no effect. He goes on to say, I have now reason to curse the day I ever knew a Christian, or a Haywood, or indeed a Manxman. End quote. Manx meaning a person originating from the Isle of Man, like Christian did. With vengeance on his mind, just like he said he would, Bly reached England and was dragged through a court-martial to determine exactly what went wrong. His extensive, bordering on obsessive, journaling meant that he had every detail ready to go. The court cleared him and the public hailed him as a hero, 
a righteous defender of the British law on the high seas. Bly had told the judges that he banked on many of the men still being on Tahiti, and as a result, a ship was sent to apprehend the mutineers. A few months later, it arrived. Upon seeing the welcome sight of the Union Jack, three men swam out to greet the boat. These were three of Bly's loyalists, men who were forced to stay behind with the mutineers due to lack of space in the rowboat. They were banking on Bly's testimony clearing them of wrongdoing, but the same could not be said for many others on the island. Those who actively supported Christian in the mutiny hid, but were eventually caught. All English sailors left alive on Tahiti were dragged back to England, and the trial was the talk of the century. Bly wasn't present, however. He was leading another expedition, and yes, before you ask, he had finally been elevated to captain, a promotion that, in his mind, was very, very overdue. In the end, out of the total of ten defenders, three were hung, the remaining seven being found innocent or acquitted. And with that, the book was closed. The public assumption was that Christian and whatever was left of his crew had probably eked out a living on some rocky, barren island before succumbing to the elements. 18 years passed. The world turned, and the story of the HMS Bounty faded from public mind. The Battle of Trafalgar had checked the power of Spain, and now Great Britain ruled the waves with no equal. Thousands of miles east, in its recently established Australian colony, an American whaling ship came across an island. It was an island that, according to the charts, should not exist. The only record of anything close by was a little-known landmass charted by someone called Robert Pitcairn over a hundred years ago. As the island grew closer, the crew noticed smoke billowing up through the tree line. The island was inhabited. Pulling in towards the coastline, the captain was startled by a rowboat of muscular young men paddling out to greet them, bearing fresh coconuts as gifts. The crew was further surprised that the men spoke to them in near-perfect English. Judging by their tanned skin, the captain figured they'd stumbled across a Spanish colony. But when one of the men called out, Did you know my father? He sailed with Captain Bly. Then suddenly, everything became clear. The American crew disembarked at the island's jetty, now named Bounty Point, and came ashore. Guided by the young men in canoes, they found a thriving population of around 35 people, mostly women, teenagers, and young children. They were strong, healthy, and happy. Living in thatched houses were the middle-aged wives and young children of the original mutineers, including Christian Fletcher's son, Thursday October Christian, who was named after the day he was born on the island. Snaking through the winding streets of the small community, the visitors met the de facto king of the island. He was 40 years old, but looked much older. Hunched, bald, and stooping, though covered in Tahitian tattoos, his whitest skin stood in stark contrast to the darker young generation that surrounded him. His name was John Adams, aka Alexander Smith, the sole surviving member of the Bounty's original crew that had set off from England almost two decades ago. Even after all this time, Adams was at first reluctant to greet the visitors, aware there was no statute of limitations on mutiny. He had taught the younger generation the word of God using the Bible left behind on the bounty. He taught them how to read and write and spun many tales about the mystical land of England, a place he called home long ago. Though the children spoke English, they spoke it with a distinctive Polynesian twist, creating a sort of Creole language that still exists to this day. But what had happened to the rest of the mutineers and the Tahitian men? What of Fletcher Christian, the leader of the mutiny? Taking a seat in the village square, now named Adams Town, the whalers listened intently to the twisted story. It's worth noting that the only written source of this comes from a Polynesian woman called Tihatue Tuona, or Jenny, as the Europeans called her. Jenny, like all the Polynesians, was taught to write by Adams. As the only man from the original crew still living, he could obviously spin this story to paint him in a more favourable light. Chances are we'll never know exactly what happened, but here's the best guess we have. Once the bounty was unpacked, and it was clear that the initial danger had passed, old rivalries flared up again, based on, you guessed it, sex. The first point of contention was what to do with the bounty. The settlers were very, very wary of being captured and dragged back to England. I mean, all dogs that they had bought with them were killed in case their barking was heard by a passing vessel. 
so a tall ship bobbing in the harbour was a very big problem. Christian, going back on his previous wishes, didn't want to destroy the ship. But in a sign that his authority was already waning, one night an Englishman named Matthew Quintal swam out and took it upon himself to torch the ship. It would be the first of several actions by Quintal that would go down to make him the most hated man in the community. As they watched their only connection to the outside world disappear beneath the swell, some felt that this was the right course of action, but others sobbed loudly, cursing themselves that they had not left with Captain Bly when they had the chance. The settlers began cultivating yams and other vegetables and made their first tents out of the sails of the ship. Christian grew depressed and distant, building himself a small hut on the coast and disappearing into it for days on end. He spent hours staring off into the distance, lamenting the choices he'd made. In this power gap, trouble began to brew. One of the sailors' wives had died shortly after arrival on the island, and he didn't think it was fair that everyone else got a wife except for him, and somehow decided he should be given one by the Polynesians. Putting aside the horrendous treatment of women just being passed around regardless of their own desires, many of the Polynesians were already living habitually, two or three men had been sharing a single wife. The sailor protested and implored the other Europeans to back his claim, but they turned him down, saying that it would stir up too many problems. But this changed when Adam's wife died from falling from the cliffs while picking bird eggs. Adam's, who was more popular and physically stronger than the other sailor, demanded he be compensated for his loss with another woman. With the backing of the Europeans, two of the Tahitian wives were taken and given to Adam's and the other sailor. Rightfully, this sparked outrage among the Polynesians. No one knew who would be next, and all hated this racial subservience that they'd been forced to endure. They worked just as hard as the European men did, so why were they being discriminated against? A plot began to slowly form to murder the white settlers and carry on this settlement without them. Christian's wife overheard one of the Polynesian women humming a kind of war song about killing white men, and immediately she went to her husband who alerted the other Europeans. The three ringleaders, knowing that they were sprung, fled to the interior and the others were caught and bound by the Europeans. They pleaded their innocence, stating that they had no knowledge of the plot. Who knows whether this was true? But Christian and the other white settlers knew that they could not run society without them. Every bit of manpower was needed here to till the fields and just keep things moving. Christian told the men that they could prove their loyalty by tracking down the three ringleaders and murdering them, which they did. Bludgeoned to death with a rock or shot in the head, soon all three men were dead. The rebellion was over, but it wouldn't last. Sometime later, things had devolved again. It seems as if the Polynesian men were being treated more and more like slaves. They were beaten excessively for minor offences, and in some occasions having salt rubbed into their wounds to increase their suffering. Routinely, they were permitted to borrow firearms to hunt pigs and other game, and once they had learnt to use them, they turned them on their cruel overlords. Christian, perhaps one of the least deserving, was killed first. Tending to his fields, he was shot in the back and finished off with an axe blow to the head. And so died the 29-year-old Englishman and mutineer, Fletcher Christian, on a tiny, uncharted speck of land in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. The massacre continued, and when it became clear what was happening, two white settlers fled to the interior. Quintal, the one that burnt the ship, was one of them. Adams was ambushed and shot through his shoulder with the bullet end down his neck. But full of adrenaline, he managed to fight off the attackers and he too disappeared into the forest. At the urging of the Polynesian women, who liked Adams, Polynesian men agreed to spare him and he was taken to a bed to recover. Left in the jungle were two Europeans and one Polynesian who had joined their ranks after being rejected by one of the women. For three uneasy weeks, these men lived in the jungle, looking into Adam's town, waiting for a chance to strike. It must have been a horrible existence for both parties, with death potentially stalking behind every rock, every fern. In the end, it was the Polynesian women who proved decisive. Apparently, preferring the company of the European men compared to the Polynesian men, they turned to the outlaws and agreed to ensnare their countrymen for them. With their help, all the remaining Polynesian men were murdered. The affair was brutal, the women themselves taking part in smashing the brains out of one of the men. Covered in blood and gore of their townsfolk, the settlers of Adamstown again joined hands. The adult population of Pitcairn Island 
was now four white men and ten Polynesian women. For a period of time, some women, now rightfully untrusting of the remaining men, chose to live in their own community, but eventually they rejoined Adamstown. One of the men, Robert Young, managed to distill moonshine from the root of a plant and seems to have tried to enjoy it in moderation. The three other men had different ideas. Drinking to near lethal levels on a daily basis, it seemed all wanted to escape from the reality that they themselves had created. One of the men, McCoy, drank himself into such a stupor that he went mad, and after several days alone in the jungle, his mangled body was found below the high cliffs. He had tied his hands and feet together to ensure that if the fall did not kill him, drowning would. His death sobered up Adams, who grew closer to Young, while Quintal continued swigging the brew daily. He became increasingly belligerent and beat his wife often, especially if he was unhappy with the meals she cooked. Eventually, pressured into finding more food for her hateful husband, she too fell to her death on the cliffs collecting bird eggs. After her death, Quintal demanded Young's wife as compensation for his loss, which even from a logistical perspective made no sense as there were now more than enough wives for three men without having to break up another couple. Young was a sickly man, and by this point he was on death's door. His untreated asthma worsened by the day in the hot tropical air. Knowing that one day soon Quintal would come for he or his wife, he approached the only one that could help, Adams. Adams agreed that Quintal needed to die, and for the last time, the two grizzled British sailors picked up the hatchet. Quintal did not go down quietly. He was a big man and Young was not much help. Ambushed in one of the huts, they pinned him down and Adams bashed his brain in with an axe until he stopped resisting. It was only once the grisly deed was done that the two men noticed a nine-year-old girl that had been in the corner of the hut. Too terrified to scream, she had witnessed the whole horrible affair and was covered in gore and warm blood. Not long after, Young's asthma finished him off and Adams said goodbye to the last white man he would see for the next 15 years. Finally... At long last, a single man was left alive, and there was peace. With the island equivalent of the purge taking place, the new generation grew up in comparative peace. The women had no desire to bring up the past, and the children had no knowledge of it. None had memory of another completely different life they longed to return to. Over time, the children began to speak Creole language we now call Pitcanese, which is still spoken today, a unique mix of Georgian-era English mixed with Tahitian. Here are a few examples. I'm probably not pronouncing them right. What are you up to? What sing yoli doing? Come on, all you kids. Come yoli sullens. Would you like some food? Ya like ya some wessels? Over the next few generations, the Pitcairn Islands became a British colony, along with Australia, which, interestingly enough, our old friend Captain Bly became the governor of. His darling wife Betsy, the one he wrote a letter to before, refused to make a long sea voyage down under, so instead Bly brought along his daughter, who looks freakishly similar to her father, to the point where I was convinced it was just him in a wig. Captain, oh, sorry, Governor Bly, as usual, ran a tight ship, strict as ever. And just like before, his subordinates hated him for it, referring to him behind his back as, quote, that bounty bastard, end quote. But, oh my God, he somehow managed to cause another mutiny against him, because of course he did. The rebellion against Bly is remembered as one of the only times in history Australia has rebelled against British rule. In the earliest political cartoon in Australia's history, it shows two troopers pulling the terrified Governor Bly out from under a bed where he supposedly hid. I'll put a picture of this up on our Patreon and Instagram page. I mean, I don't even know what to say about this. How the hell did this guy not once in his lifetime think, hmm, I really seem to bring out the worst in people, don't I? Perhaps, perhaps I'm the problem? No, no, of course not. Bly's legacy is summed up well by historian John Beaglehorn, quote, His dogmatic judgments, which he felt himself entitled to make, he saw fools about him too easily. Thin-skinned vanity was his curse through life. He never learned that you do not make friends of men by insulting them, end quote. Bly clearly had a superior mind. He was an expert navigator and cool-headed in a crisis. He served with Captain Cook and Horatio Nelson, 
the latter of which praised his conduct personally, but he never did get the personality trait of ruling sorted. After the second mutiny against him, he went back to London and died a few years later. I was surprised to see his grave was less than one hour away from when I live. I went to see it and, wow, <laughs> on the top of it, I swear, is a stone carving of a breadfruit. <laughs> I couldn't believe it, but it turns out it's actually meant to be the eternal flame. But look, I've seen the eternal flame, and that's not it. Say what you want, but that's a breadfruit. A few others have pointed this out too, so perhaps the carver maybe had a sense of humour? I don't know. I'll chuck a picture of it on our website. Back on Pitcairn, John Adams died a few years later. Despite a royal pardon being issued for his role in the mutiny, he never tried to return to England. His original gravestone has been plucked off the island and added to the British Museum along with half the treasure of the known world. I've got a picture of it on our website. Since the rediscovery of the island and its formal incorporation into the British Empire, the story of the mutineer and the settlers has been portrayed in many films and books over the years. My favourite of which is the 1984 film The Bounty, starring Mel Gibson as Fletcher Christian and Anthony Hopkins as William Bly. I really recommend watching this, but even if you don't, at least YouTube the scenes of Anthony Hopkins. His intensive rants in the face of all his crew are fantastic, and when I think of Captain Bly, I just instinctively picture him now. With each remake, the pendulum of blame swings between Christian and Bly, with each director obviously having a bias. In my own opinion that I've tried to portray in this retelling, it wasn't so clear-cut. Both men had their strengths and weaknesses, like we all do, This was just one of these rare instances where there was no room to get away from it, nowhere to hide. Ultimately, Christian Fletcher made a decision, a decision I believe he regretted, but one that was made because he felt so utterly hopeless in the situation he found himself in. In recent years, the island nation has made the news for all the wrong reasons. Just a warning now, there's a discussion of rape, incest, pedophilia in this bit, so feel free to switch off now. In the early 2000s, a case was filed against many native Pitcairn men. The crux of the case related to 55 charges of rape, sexual exploitation and coercion against the women of the island, most of which were under 15 years old. Putting the disgusting nature of the charges aside for a moment, the initial defence was a very interesting one. The lawyers for the accused argued that when Christian Adams, Quintal and the rest of the crew burnt the HMS bounty off the coast of the island, they were effectively renouncing their British citizenship. And this meant that the British Sexual Offences Act of 1956 did not apply to them. This was skillfully countered by the Crown's lawyers who listed the instances in the island's history where they had called on the British government to administer court cases. Once it became clear the charges would stick, the defenders won the right to have the proceedings take place on Pitcairn Island rather than New Zealand, which had been originally planned. So, a Supreme Court of Pitcairn was built solely for the trial. The attitude towards the accused by the rest of the population differed hugely. A good few stated this predatory attitude towards, well, children was just part of the culture that had been inherited from their Tahitian roots. Quote, I think the girls were conditioned to accept that it was a man's world, and once they turned 12, they were eligible. End quote while an older grandmother on the island who obviously had the same thing done to her as a child stated that she didn't really see what the fuss was all about, following up that this was just how life was on Pitcairn. The anachronistic view of it's always been this way is obviously wrong on so many levels. According to Bly's journal, the people of Tahiti would occasionally practice human sacrifice, but no one was begging to hold on to this tradition, were they? As the trial went on, it became depressingly clear that the views of some of the population had progressed little since the days of Adam and Quintal fighting over women like pieces of meat. The jaw-dropping levels of depravity were made clear to the world. Girls as young as five being forced to perform oral sex on 50-year-old men, kids walking home from collecting firewood, being grabbed and raped on the side of the road, really disgusting stuff. The defendants, one of which was the mayor on Pitcairn, were all descendants from the original mutineers, sporting last names like Christian, Young and Adams. They too expressed ranging levels of remorse. Many flat out denied they had done anything wrong, and instead spread rumours that it was a British Crown conspiracy to shut down the island. One of the defendants stated it was just part of normal life on Pitcairn, but followed up with, quote, I regret it now, 
Times are changing. Things are moving forward. And obviously what we did was not normal. End quote. When it became clear that these men were going to go down for this crime, the defence strategy shifted again. With a population at the time of 64 people and dropping, it was put forth that the island simply could not function without these men. They were needed to literally keep the place running. The longboat, for instance, was the island's only real connection with the outside world, and most of the accused were the ones that operated it. This, it was pointed out, was probably another example of power and coercion. By excluding all others from learning how to operate the boat, they were forced into relying on these men. In the end, six of the seven men accused were found guilty on 35 of 55 charges. Their sentences took into account their unique situation and the vital role they played in the island's economy. The two men who showed the most regret were given community service sentences. Three other men, including the mayor, were given sentences varying from two to six years, most of which have since been completed. Even before, the population of the island had been dwindling by the year, and the international court case really didn't encourage new settlers. Even though there's been incentives started to encourage migration to the island, nothing has come from it. For a community that quite literally will cease to exist without immigration, it's not an easy or cheap place to get to. Citizenship is still difficult to attain, and life on the island is not easy. Everyone needs to pitch in. And that's to say nothing of the social attitudes towards women, which I'm sure still persist to this day. At the time of writing this, the island's population sits at 47, mostly people from older generations. Those born recently generally leave for education in New Zealand and don't show much interest in returning. It seems like, unless there are some very, very good incentives to put in place for migrants, within the next 20 years or so, the British government will need to make their decision on the fate of the pit Kenese. And if that happens, for better or worse, another little chip of what makes our shared history so interesting and so unique disappears with it. This has been Anthology of Heroes. Thanks for listening. A big thank you to the show's Patreons, Luke, Malcolm, Tom, and Claudia. A lot of people don't realise it, but this is a one-man show, so there's quite a bit of time that goes into producing it. I love sharing these stories, and it means a ton knowing that there's a people out there who are really enjoying them. You guys help me keep the costs down for things like web hosting, sound libraries, books, and stuff like that. If you're not a patron already, we've got some cool rewards up, like having the option to read out some quotes I use in the show. If you want to have a look, tap the link in our bio.